I looked on the CCTV and I just saw a bunch of people just rolling up to the crib. I was thinking, what is going on? I tried to call him. I told him, you said there's two people that are coming to stay in the house, but a bag of eight people have come in. 20 minutes later, he just stopped answering. So I got a couple of my friends who went to the house. When we went in there, my heart literally sank. What were your takeaway lessons? Hell of a lot. And we are back with another episode of the PBK podcast. Each and every week, I bring you an amazing guest. This week, we have Reese. Reese, how you doing? I'm good, man. I'm good. How are you? Reese, aka Mr. RJ Hustle. That's Where did that name come from? Um, obviously, like with ends, people always have kind of like tag names. Mm. My name, Reese Jensen, RJ. That's okay. where it came from. And then Hustle, I feel like because I was always kind of like hustling and bustling and just very concerned about trying to make money, mm -hmm. that's where the hustle came from. So RJ Hustle as a tagline, it just kind of clicked. It just clicked, so you ran with it. Exactly. I mean, you, you did amazing things on social media. Yeah, but before yeah. we get into your social side of things, tell people who you are and what you do. Who am I? Um, it's funny because of what we're talking about, but I would say... Obviously, I'm a property developer now, um, went to uni, I'm currently buying properties, focusing on HMO conversions for the time being, and just, yeah, looking to scale, building a property company, and just documenting my journey as I go along. How important do you think documenting your journey is? For me, it's been massively important. I feel like it's something that people sleep on a lot, mm -hmm. because... Everyone thinks everything needs to kind of be polished and they need to just show things when you've got the results. But when I kind of came out and bought the first house, documented it and went through that process of showing people what I'm doing, mm -hmm. it attracted a lot more people and a lot of like authentic sort of, what do you call it, attention. Mm -hmm. And that's helped me in what I'm literally currently doing now in terms of raising funds, buying more houses, working with people that bring more opportunities, etc. So I think it's massively important. I think people like to see behind the scenes. They like to see a bit of the struggle. Yeah. Like it's all nice to see the key pictures and to see the nice afters. Yeah. But it's, you know, there's a reason why almost the Shea Borough does better than positive news. People like to see exactly. the struggle. <laughs> exactly that. So you give them, give them a little bit of struggle, a little bit of hardship. What is some of the content you've put out that's done the best? It's funny you say that um, because a couple of my videos that have been the most viral are the mm -hmm. ones that have ended up on like the shade bar and those are the ones where negative things have happened. Mm -hmm. So the most viral one is where basically I started um, documenting, not documenting, but running my house as an Airbnb type mm -hmm. of house, right? And then I was very new into it. I didn't really know how to mitigate against certain things and people booked it like, just to kind of throw a party. And I didn't know then that that's what they were trying to do. And I looked on the CCTV and I just saw a bunch of people just rolling up to the crib, speakers, hoodies, everything. I was thinking, what is going on? So then I tried to call him. I told him that, look, you said there's two people um, that are coming to stay in the house, but like a bag of eight people have come in. So then he was like, oh, okay, cool. I'll get them out, whatever. And then 20 minutes later, he just stopped answering. So I got a couple of my friends, we went to the house and then when we went in there, they were just doing a bunch of random things, speaker there, et cetera. Luckily I so got there. They were there getting ready to ready, big proper, vibes, proper vibes ready. People that being prepared. I, I, exactly. People that have seen the video um, would have seen what had happened, but then yeah, managed to get them out just before they could throw like a mad party mm -hmm. because a situation happened prior to that, I think the month before where something similar happened, it caused um, basically headache with the neighbours and they were threatening to report me to the local council. So then I just couldn't have another situation like that. And then I just thought, you know what, how could I basically take advantage of the situation almost? So I just documented it, put it online, then it just went crazy viral. Yeah, no, I saw that. I think being like still a young black man, like, with people throwing your party, to affect, throwing parties that are going to affect your business. So looking at business on one side, but these are kind of your peers, your people. How do you find like dealing with that? It was, it's funny because even when I went to the house, I didn't even think that they expected to see someone that looked like me. Mm. But because I used to kind of be on the same type of things as well, I was empathetic in that sort of way. But I just thought like, look, 
cool, you might want to do these types of things, but you're not going to do it in my house. Mm -hmm. Like that, that was the type of um, vibe and energy I came on. You gave them the old school. You ain't got to go home, but you exactly. got to get the hell out of here. Exactly that still. Because <laughs> I think like, it's really interesting, you know, when people are, because you're how old now? 23. 23. And you don't look like what a lot of people think a landlord property developer yeah. looks like. Yeah. What's been the response from like your friends, peers, when you're talking about, look, I'm not trying to go to the party. I've got, you know, I've got to run my numbers on my GDV. Like, yeah. what's the response for the people around you? That's a good question. Do you know what? I would say it's been, it's actually been quite positive mm. and quite, um, they've, they've received it well because, and that's kind of partly why I've kept my name as like RJ Hustle, because it's kind of like a juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. You would, you would see that name and you'd see someone like me and you'd think, okay, cool. Maybe he's on this and that, but with me doing what I'm doing, that's what, tends to attract a lot more people because it's like, wow, like someone that's like us from ends, etc., doing big things. They've kind of told me, it's like, you inspire us to be more and do more. And there was one time I even got a message um, from someone who was like, bro, like every time I watch your stories, like you just, you just inspire me to just do mad things in my life. So um, yeah, nice. No, it's, it's, it's quite well, That positive. must be a good feeling for yeah, you yeah. to keep pushing when, when it's stressful, when you're exactly. getting stressed from solicitors and lenders and all the people that we have to deal with. Property stress is the absolute worst thing in life as well. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a lot. Every, everything's very slow. Everything takes Man, longer than you want. No. Oh my days. That's one thing about property. Um, it's just such a slow paced environment and a slow paced game. So when I see um, people trying to make it seem like, you know, you're going to get things done very, very mm -hmm. quickly in property, I just think like you're just doing people a disservice because mm -hmm. you're marketing it, making it seem like, cool, you'll just jump in in property and then become a millionaire tomorrow. But in reality, it's the complete opposite because even just buying a house, I've been buying one since I think March. Mm -hmm. And we're only just about to get the keys yeah. to one of them. Started the conveyancing on the second, probably going to get the keys in like October. And another one is involved in a chain. So that's going to take even longer. So yeah, property is very, very slow paced. It is. Is um some of the maybe misconceptions that get put out there through social media, is that is that why you're wearing that t-shirt today? What does that course, say? Man. Please stop lying on social media. Listen, can, can we listen, please? Can, can we please do that? Because... Lying. You don't have to lie. Exactly. You don't have like, you know, it doesn't matter whether you've got 10 followers, 10,000, 10 million, just be yourself. That's and it. And people will resonate a lot more with people that are being their authentic self. Yeah. Yeah. So Definitely. with the name like RJ Hustle, I think when people start to get into, into business and they start to feel like I'm a, I'm a businessman, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm the director, I'm the CEO, I find it quite common that people often lose the hustle of mm. like, I've got to find ways to make this work. Mm -hmm. How have you managed to retain that sort of hustling mentality? Through going through the processing, like my morning routines, for mm. example, literally every day, I just try to connect with my mission and my goals. So it's just going through the process of, okay, cool. Like what's my overall mission? Where do I want to be in like 20 years? Where do I want to be in five years? Where do I want to be next year? And through going through that process and connecting with like my dreams and my goals, that reminds me that there's still a long way that I have to go. And it helps me to like kind of get excited about what I need to do today in order to put me in a better position tomorrow. Are you an early riser? I'm, I've, yeah, yeah. I used to be bad. Like I used to wake up maybe 10, 11. And I would say that that's because of obviously being at university, mm. having my own schedule and not being in full-time employment or having to work for someone else. I've kind of had my own schedule for a while now, but recently I'd say this past year, I've made it a thing to start waking up earlier. So now on a late day, I would say I wake up around 8.39 mm -hmm. on an average day, usually around seven. Okay. Yeah. So you get, I think the thing is that like, I don't like early mornings. Yeah. And I remember like, I remember when I was talking to someone who was kind of helping me just kind of help curate my life. And I was like saying, ah, oh, you know, I'm, I'm naturally quite lazy. Mm. And she was like, but why did you say that? And I was like, well, mm. you're not really lazy. You just tend to be a night owl. And I think a lot of the time people say, oh, you, if you want to be like a businessman, you've got to do 5 a.m. You've got to have yeah. already done yeah. six runs, yeah. journaled. Yeah. But I think you've got to find what works for you, exactly. right? Exactly. Exactly. I have a thing. It's like um, one of my mentors actually, he's told me 
no framework is ever more senior than a person itself. Mm -hmm. So I say that to say with people online, they like to say a lot of things like, oh, wake up at this time, you have to do this, you must do that. Mm -hmm. But if someone, basically, we, we know as people what works for us. And if someone's telling you something like it has to be like this and you know that doesn't work for you, you don't necessarily have to take it and mm -hmm. instill it in your life because what works for you might not work for someone else. Exactly. And that. I say that to say with a lot of people online, they try to make it seem like, cool, it has to be like this, has to be like this if you want to be successful. But I just like to take different bits of information and apply what would make sense for my situation and then use that to um, basically take me to the next level. No, I, think that, I think that's great advice for any sort of up and coming entrepreneur. Yeah. Let's get back to the business side of it because we, we spoke about it very frequently, but this is a, a property-based podcast. It is. So... How do you, when you first really started getting interested in property? I would say it's probably from when I was mad, mad young because I love Monopoly. Mm. Like I've, I've you always good? been, I would, no, no one can you, be, I, I can say this live on YouTube. Listen, if anybody wants to link me on Monopoly, we can run it. See, look can put however much no, money like, you see, want to put down. down on it. He's playing Monopoly on, um, they're like on PS5, PS4, yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever it was like. And that was that was the time, you know. Yeah. We was doing lockdown, yeah. money, real money games on lockdown yeah. or every day on Monopoly. Now yeah. we can. Have you ever tried Monopoly Deal? No. You see that card what game? That one? It's it's like imagine they've mixed Monopoly with poker, and it's a card game. But it's trust me, I'm gonna put you okay. onto that one. That's that's gonna be my gift to you. I'm gonna yeah. send you a Monopoly Deal. Hold on to that, guys. Hold yeah, on yeah, to yeah. It. No problem. Okay, so you like Monopoly? That yeah. was the idea of ownership, buying the block. If yeah, you yeah. buy certain properties you can add value effectively and you, you always saw that and then when did you now take that interest into actually turning that into action i would say so with the monopoly thing that was that kind of the initial interest then obviously going around ends always seeing new developments happening i would always think like who's on the other side of building these mm -hmm. houses building these apartments etc then when I went to university in my second year. And you me, went to which university? Leicester, okay. University of Leicester. And what did you study? I studied accounting and finance. Nice. Financial economics at first, but the, the maths was, was killing me. I had to, yeah, no, had to the, switch. I see, I love maths. Yeah. So like for me, that was what saved me because everything else was like, but the maths side of it was yeah. where like the quants and all of that, that, yeah. was, that was my zone. I, I just never got like, as soon as maths became more about letters and this and that, I just said, you know what, this is beyond me. And I just, I stayed okay. in my lane. No problem. I stayed in my lane. But um, yeah, so second year of university, I was living with three of my other friends, four of us in like a mid terrace. It was a traditionally, I think a two bedroom, but through changing one of the sitting rooms downstairs and whatnot, and one of the other rooms upstairs, they made it into a four bedroom. So just a standard mm -hmm. house. When I did the maths, I think we paid around probably like 20,000, 20,000 or more to the landlord. And we weren't even there for a full year. We were there from like maybe September to just about May. Mm -hmm. So then I was thinking, cool, if we're paying this landlord this much and this house is just average, how can I basically end up on the other side of this power dynamic rather than me just being the one to always pay out to landlords, pay out to landlords? So... At that time, I was 19, I think. And that's when I took the active interest in, okay, as soon as I graduate, I'm going to find a way to get into property. Mm. And what was the first property you purchased? It was a free bed in Leicester. Free yeah. bed in Leicester. Literally, I think it's like 10 minutes away from the uni campus. But talk me through the process. Because a lot of people here, okay, you make it sound like I like property. Yeah. I finished uni. Yeah. Now I bought a property. Yeah. Talk me through your actual process of how did you go from an interest Yeah to actually delivering on that. Yeah, definitely. So one thing about me, I'm very obsessive when I'm interested in something. So as soon as that, I guess it's like a light bulb moment mm. happened, I said, okay, what can I do to make sure I'm in a position to be able to buy a house as soon as I graduate? And that's when I kind of put uni on the back burn burner. And I said, okay, from second year to third year, the next two years, I'm going to dedicate myself to literally making money, doing whatever I can so that I can basically save that money up and then use that to buy the house. So from my student finance, I've got bursary as well. I was just saving that, saving that. Um, summers, when I'd go back to Enns, Woolwich, mm -hmm. um, I was working warehouse. Then it was doing that. I, feel, I thought like, 
you know, working for someone else and doing long shifts like that, I just can't be bothered to do it. So then when I came back to university, I just said, you know what, let me just go as hard as I can, start different types of businesses, crypto, et cetera, and make as much as I can so that I basically don't have to work for anyone as soon as I graduate. So then as soon as I came back the next two years, that's exactly what I did. Nobody ever really saw me at university because I just said, yeah, you know what, this degree, I have no interest really in becoming an accountant, working for someone else. So then I just dedicated myself to to just making money to buy the house. Yeah. And I think it's that concept of short-term sacrifice for long-term gain. Yeah, I think if you're going down a more conventional route, i.e. like the accounting role, your, your trajectory is very much like, okay, I'm going to do my three to five years at uni, depending on your yeah, qualifications. Yeah. So I finish at 23, I get my first graduate role. Then I get, you know, a more established role then a senior role. And you can see that, okay, I can kind of take a bit of time to enjoy those early 20s because my life's almost planned. Mm -hmm. But whereas with an entrepreneur, you know that that's a roller coaster you're going to have to ride. Yeah. So you have to really lock in and say, look, you know what, let me try and work hard now so I can enjoy it at that, that later date. Exactly. So how much was that first property that you bought? I bought it for 170 at auction. 170, and auction was your first first purchase? It was in hand. Okay, now we're crazy. Now we're going to talk about this yeah, now. Yeah. How did you feel confident enough to buy your first property at auction? Do you know what? I don't even think it was a thing of confidence. It's like when you try anything new, mm. you don't necessarily have any like scars or any bad experiences mm -hmm. with doing something. So I just thought, oh, cool, homes under the hammer type thing. Just go to auction, put your bid in, buy the house, do the work. Like it's, it's just fine. And I guess it was my naivety and my just raw excitement of wanting to buy a house mm. that pushed me or gave me the confidence to be able to do it. But then... So let's talk through it. So, oh my gosh! I hope you viewed the property first. I did. You, okay, yeah, okay. That's yeah, that's, that's a good did. starting point. I did. Did you get an independent like legal review of the of the auction pack? Prior? I did. I remember I got a solicitor to read through and they charged me for it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. So yeah. you at least you at least did that there yeah. too. Did you have like your finance lined up prior to the auction? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay. And that was where the nightmare started to to just kicked me in the ass oh it was yeah yeah and my final question had you had any builders to give you some indicative quotes of what your works were going to cost prior to going ahead yeah but it was it was the most backhanded unreliable quote on earth okay yeah so i think if you are going to auction they're probably your four things at a minimum a million percent. that you've got to make sure that percent. when we say like getting your ducks in a row, they're the That's ones it. that you need to tick off. So have the um, legal review, make sure you've got your finance lined up, mm -hmm. make sure you view the property and make sure you've got an idea of what mm -hmm. your works are going to cost and if you need any consents for those works. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you ended up winning. What was, did you have to go to, was that online or was that yeah. in person? I haven't actually seen any in-person auctions since COVID. So yeah, I think so everything's just online now. I think who has, I think it might be Bernard Marcus that still has them, but they're very few and far between yeah. now. Okay, so what was the feeling like of actually that day at your, you've gone to bid? Was there only one lot you were looking at or did you have? There were three. Okay. There were three. Um, there was one, it just went crazy. Yeah. Like, it just went crazy. I didn't bother. There was a second one. I'm trying to think if this one came before or after my one that I won. I think it was after it, yeah, because I won my one and then the next lot, if I ended up getting the next lot, I would have made a way more money because mm. no one bid on it for some reason. Like it went for cheap. Yeah. I mean, you never know. And I think I've definitely got an attitude that just whatever is meant for me will be mine. And if yeah. it's not, maybe someone was saving me from something. Maybe that was it's the true. one that you were going to find out had the crazy subsidence that you missed out on because it was early on. Yeah. So you won for around 170 and this was a HMO conversion? It was meant to be. Okay. But obviously Article 4, that's that's even something else mm -hmm. as well. Um, so the reason why I bought it was because it's near the uni mm -hmm. and I wanted to make it like a student HMO. Mm -hmm. These times I didn't know anything about Article 4, different types of um, 
safety stuff that you'd have to comply mm. with, licensing, etc. I was just a raw novice of, cool, I have this idea, I want to make it happen, let me buy the house mm. and make it happen. But then through going through that process, I found out, okay, cool, Article 4, you'd have to get planning permission. I checked on um, like the local register, nothing, nothing had, had been passed for new HMOs. Mm -hmm. So I just thought there's no point, it would just be a waste of money. And then that's when it changed from wanting it to be a HMO conversion to it just being a straightforward flip. And then it changed again, just because of um, the nightmare of the builders. So talk to me about that. What did you learn from that project? What were your takeaway lessons? Thank you to those of you who have liked, shared, commented, but most importantly, subscribed to the channel. Did you know only 28% of people that regularly watch my videos have subscribed? Now we're trying to get that to 40% so we can bring on bigger and better guests and make better content for you. So if you could do that right now, myself and my team would really appreciate it. Now back to the video. Hell of a lot. So the first one that we kind of said is having your ducks in a row before buying mm -hmm. that auction, making sure the finances lined up. Um, if you can make sure you have builder quotes, to back it up as well. That will come in handy if you're getting development finance. Um, Did you get else? development finance on that one? I was meant to, but because I was like a first time developer, etc. The bridging lender that I went with, I think it was, who did my broker pin with? Together, Together, Together Finance. Yeah. He literally told me, I, I remember the phone call, he was like, um, I was like, hey Glenn, um, I've, I've, I've won like the property, I'm ready to um, like basically proceed with the lending. Then he was like, Mate, mate, sorry to break it down to you, but um, I kid you not, like I didn't want you to do this, but um, the lenders literally stopped doing developments, finance for first time um, mm. buyers and whatnot. And then I didn't have enough money to fund the purchase and the works. So my heart literally sank as soon as he told me that because auction, you have 30 days to complete of course. it. Or the um, vendor can basically just pull the, yeah. pull the deal and the deposit that you've paid is gone. So for the next like week or two weeks, I was scrambling trying to figure out, cool, how am I gonna rise? I think it was like another 20 or 30 grand that I needed to um, basically raise for the development. But then I ended up doing it. And then, yeah, that's that's another lesson. Another one- Do you one, work well under pressure? Do you work well under I think I do. I think I do because even one of my mentors, he said that pressure is a privilege mm -hmm. and obviously pressure makes diamonds. And if you think about us as human beings, we've kind of been conditioned to just kind of cruise and we don't really make things happen until the pressure is on mm -hmm. and we have like a deadline to meet because it's kind of like that cliche saying, if, if someone's threatening to like end your life or whatever, you'll find a way to make anything happen. Mm -hmm. So it's just about putting that pressure on so that we can just make things happen whenever we want to. So I say that to say with that auction experience, everything was kind of working against me, but because the pressure was on and because I had to make things happen, I made it happen. Yeah. Now, of course, I think for a lot of people, that experience sometimes, and I've seen it particularly with people that are maybe slightly older, they have those negative experiences and they say, never again. Yeah, they say, yeah. yep, once is enough, exactly. not getting me again. Exactly. But for you, where did it still push you to say, okay, you know what, I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do this with less mistakes now? Do you know what? I'm, I'm not even going to lie and say like, yeah, like I was still mad confident after that first deal. After that first deal, because more L's basically happened, right? So I was meant to buy it and then flip it mm -hmm. after the HMO conversion thing um, failed. Sold it. I was getting excited. I was thinking, yeah, cool. I'm going to have a hundred grand plus in my account. I'm going to use that to do more deals, et cetera, et cetera. Then after the, um, the buyers, mm -hmm. they got a survey done and the surveyor came round. He was just saying, yep, yeah, this house, this is wrong. 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 Then the buyers basically called the agents and said, yep, yeah, can't lie. We are no longer buying this house. So then the agent came and spoke to me and said, cool, look, this is what the surveyor said that like, have a, have a look and maybe address Was it a home these. buyer survey or was it the actual survey? Home buyer survey, I think. Okay. I think it was, yeah. I think it was that. Uh, you see, you see as developers, yeah. home buyer surveys, we hate them because <laughs> it's like they're, Obviously, it's quite a low level survey in terms of mm. it costs like 300 pounds. Mm. 
and they'll come and be like, with no context, mm -hmm. the roof looks old, might need changing. Do you know what I mean? Have you been up there? The roof is fine. It's a Victorian property. We trust it. They were building for longevity back exactly. then. So I've literally had one recently where I'm selling somewhere and they were like, the floors seem uneven. There may be movement and all, all the joists needs replaced. And I'm like, mm. this is like a 12, a, a conversion I did like 11 years ago. It's mm -hmm. fine. We've had no issues. Mm -hmm. But I think it depends on the market you're operating in. Yeah. Yeah. So um, with that, so because he, he was even saying incorrect stuff like it's in a conservation area when the road next to us was, but we weren't. Mm. So he was just saying a bunch of negative things that made them pull out. And then I tried to call the builder saying, cool, like, can you come and fix these things? They tried, but then obviously with builders, once you've paid them, they, they just don't care. Mm. So I had this house. I couldn't really sell it. I, I could try, but obviously with a bridging loan, I was coming close to the end of the term. And I was thinking, do I really want to risk another sell potentially falling through? Because one mm. in three households fall through. Or should I just refinance it, be safe and keep it? So I tried to refinance it. No mortgage lender was trying to take me on. They were like, yeah, young. I was 22 at the time. First time landlord, not in full-time employment, etc. So no like high street lenders or whatever were trying to take me on. Tried to go down a specialist route. They were still saying no. So what I had to do was more or less transfer the ownership to me and my dad's name yeah. because obviously he he owns houses he is um, in full-time employment etc seen as an experienced landlord had to pay stamp duty again because it's seen as like selling the house and then that's how i got um the mortgage and i just it's, it's crazy how it happened literally the day that the bridging loan was going to expire they came through transferred the mm -hmm. funds there was a shortfall that i had to come out of pocket for as well um, and then, yeah, that's that's how I came out of that situation. But I say all of that to say, knowing all of your exits, that's another lesson mm -hmm. that I learned very early on. Builders, getting the build quotes, etc. Because um, now I see you've gone from, like you said, sort of back of like back of a piece of paper just yeah. like yeah i'll do the works to your latest contracts i think you're using a jtc contract yeah. that's over 150 that pages oh my gosh it's 100 plus pages um but to be fair because this build is 186 mm -hmm. so imagine with this much money things have to be yeah. rock solid in place so um yeah that's that's the other lesson yeah those those are the main lessons i would say yeah those are the main ones Given what you learned and where you are now, would you still buy that first property? I would. I mm. actually would. I would. I want to say, say that, that I'm, I'm going to come to that question mm. as well. I was just going to say, I, I want to say that I would, I would have done things differently, but I'm a big believer in everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. So I say that to say, if everything went smoothly with that first project, that would have kind of instilled bad habits because I wasn't, on the thing of getting build quotes, of checking things, just kind of trusting the builders, not um, getting drawings done, etc. So if things went flying for me with that project, I would have taken those habits onto mm. further projects and then I would have maybe messed up on a bigger build like this one. Where there wasn't an opportunity exactly. to be able to say, okay, I can make up a 20,000 pound exactly shortfall because that, yeah. making up 20,000 is way different from making up 180. Do you know what I mean? And I think one of the most common things is we learn through pain. That's it. We spoke before the podcast that yeah. you're boxing. You've been boxing for the last couple yeah, of yeah, years. Yeah. When you get hit in your face, like you remember to keep your yeah, hands exactly up. Exactly that. <laughs> Whereas exactly. if you fly through and, you know, you'll get too casual too yeah. easy. So I think definitely the reason I asked if you would do it again is a lot mm -hmm. of people have hardship. Mm -hmm. And then they say, you know, never again, I'm not doing it. Mm -hmm. But actually the value maybe wasn't in the deal itself even though you were able to make it profitable through the Airbnb space and stuff like that, mm -hmm. the value was in what you learned and what that's going to save you in future projects and help yeah. you make money in future projects. Yeah, definitely. It's amazing. So moving forward, that was your first project. What are you currently working? So currently you're focusing on HMO conversion. So same yeah. area, I'm assuming no, no, different Darby, area now. Derby. So um, ideally I would want to do it in Leicester, but because it is Article 4, the so way for I those would, are, obviously not everyone knows yeah, so for those yeah, that are not yeah, familiar so you know, now we're talking to all different types of people yeah article four explain it please so article four um quite simply it's a ban 
that councils can impose on mm. certain permitted development rights usually is for HMO conversions, so conversion from C3 to C4. And that's what is in Leicester. I think it's been in there for since like 2014 or something. Mm-hmm. So typically your landlords can turn a house from a residential dwelling to a HMO without having to go through planning. You just have to get the license. Mm-hmm. But where they impose Article 4, you now have to get full planning permission. Mm-hmm. And typically, if a council's impose Article 4 to stop further HMOs being created, mm-hmm. nine times out of ten, you're, you're not going to get it. Mm-hmm. You're not going to get it. Okay, so you've moved over to a new area. How did you actually identify Derby as an area that you wanted to invest in? Good question. So I kind of just did process of elimination. So Leicester, that's where I'd started. I was looking at the nearby major cities. Mm -hmm. Coventry recently became Article 4, Nottingham's Article 4, Birmingham's Article 4, and then there's Derby. Derby is like the last, I think, major city in like the East Midlands region that isn't Article 4. So I said, cool, you know what? Derby's there. It works similar price point to Leicester in terms of the houses. Mm -hmm. So I would roughly need around about the same amount of money to do a project in Derby as I Mm -hmm. would in Leicester. And then that's that's how I chose it. But saying that, they're literally bringing in Article 4, May the 3rd next year. But that's not too bad when you're an early adopter, right? Because if you get in early, the value of your assets because of supply and demand now goes up. Yeah. Um. Are you getting full planning still for your um, for your HMO conversions in Derby? I'm doing it. So one of them, we're extending at the rear. We're doing a side mm. extension and we're doing an L-shaped dormer extension in the loft. Okay, like the outrigger that, across. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. On, onto the outrigger. Um, we're doing that under, it's all under permitted development and then prior approval for mm. the extension. I'd give you, I would say, regardless if they're bringing it in, mm. And particularly when it comes to like lending as well, if Article 4 is not in the area yet, just go for full planning for your HMOs because it just means that you've got that in your back pocket already. You're going to hopefully increase the value. And also sometimes if you're looking at maybe a blended valuation for a commercial valve the back end, you can get slightly more money as well. Yeah, yeah. actually um, saying that I got the valuation report Mm -hmm. on one of them. Um, We've got the commercial Mm-hmm. And they've pre-confirmed it at 440. Okay. So my broker reckons on the back end of it, depending on the yield that they use, we might even be able to get 460, 470 nice. on that valuation. Nice, nice. You're moving. As a South Londoner, yeah. Do you miss like do you miss London now that you're living out? I do and I don't. I'm always here. Okay. I'm always here. Literally, well, then like, you now miss it I'm if here. you're always here. It's true, but I, I feel like because it's, it's summer. It's yeah. summer. You know, most of my people are down here. Um, I like to kind of dip in and out. Mm. I don't like to always be in and amongst the noise mm. because I can get distracted quite easily. Mm-hmm. So I like to be out of the way and then come in, have my fun when I need to, um, mix my friends when I need to. And then, mm-hmm. yeah, but I say that to, yeah, I do kind of miss but London. The reason I ask is you, you touched on like one of the early things outside of being worse than me at Monopoly that um, inspired you was looking at... <laughs> you guys need to remember this. <laughs> was looking at the development. This, so yeah. looking at developments yeah, yeah, yeah. and those types of things in your local area. Is that still something that's kind of on that, on that vision board to say, I, I want to do something like close to home where I can say, Definitely. that's me. Definitely, because even when I go back to like Plumstead and Woolwich mm. now, I see a lot of these big players. I think it's like Peabody, Berkeley. Yeah. They're building all around the ends. Super. Like So the whole of like, you know, we talk about Woolwich, which is part of the Greenwich Borough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything on the river, we've seen where it goes. We've seen it with Clapham, Battersea. Yeah. We've seen it with, you know, going towards Peckham and it's, it's going to happen the same in, in Greenwich. And at the moment... Um, you know, house prices there, you can still buy like three, four bedroom houses for 400 to 500,000. Yeah. But the two bedroom flats on the river yeah. are 550 to Crazy. 700, some Crazy of them, money. if they've got yeah. really nice views. Crazy money. So you can see the potential. Definitely. So I think you're, definitely. you're in an area, your hometown is definitely somewhere that despite Crossrail already going there, despite mm-hmm. a lot of infrastructure investment, I still think it's got a lot of potential mm. for uplifting value. Yeah, that's why I'm trying to... Midlands, I just need to... I need to set my base in the Midlands as quick as possible. Mm-hmm. We'll come back down to London, do the same. Nice. That's my plan. You mentioned sort of not liking to be around the hustle and bustle. 
I've seen you sometimes online. I saw you on your head the other day doing yoga. Yeah. I've seen you, you know, out in <laughs> Albania doing doing backflips into into piles of. Yeah, do, yeah. do you think you like to get out of your comfort zone? I feel like I've made it a conscious thing now to kind of expand my experiences almost mm -hmm. and just mix with different types of people because growing up in the same area for what 20 18 years actually mm -hmm. and then now being in Leicester for the next four or five I just kind of like to just experience different types of things be with different types of people um, get different types of inspiration mm. how do you think that's benefited you like being around people doing different things it's opened my eyes to what is possible. So prior, I think for a large majority of my life, I thought that, cool, people from ends, if you're going to be successful kind of young, it was like one of two things. Musician, talented in some form of way, or you're just like, just an outright hustler. So I feel like stepping out and experiencing different things mm. has allowed me to see what is possible um, and what different types of people are doing. I think it's great. I think being able to have conversations like this to see yeah. what different people are doing. Yeah, yeah. Like we had Anastasia on recently who yeah, yeah, by yeah. doing something very bespoke with ILAs, like a singular Sick, piece yeah. of, um, you know, a singular product that she offers effectively building mm -hmm. a seven figure business. And you say, okay, you know what? I don't have to have seven streams of income. I don't have to do oh, so many yeah, different things. Yeah. I can just do one thing amazingly and it doesn't, like you say, it doesn't have to be football, music, like, you know, the kind of more cliche stuff. I can turn around and say that, you know, I'm, I'm going to make these plant pots, but I'm going to make them branded. I'm going to get it out there. I'm going to put some passion behind it and I'm going to win. Yeah. Even if you look at all of these products here, yeah. someone has literally become a millionaire from it. Yeah. Someone's become a millionaire from it. And I feel like that whole multiple streams of income, malarkey and whatnot is, is nonsense. It's nonsense in my opinion. Talking of nonsense, what are some of the, because you've spoken obviously people lying on social media. Yeah. You've spoken on obviously some sort of myths. What are some other myths that based on your experience, you now have realized that that's just a good sound way. It's not really, not really true when it comes to doing business. Ooh, that's a good question. That's a very good question. I think... So that waking up early type of stuff, it sounds good, but do what works for you. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, multiple streams of income. It's not really realistic um, because building a business, I've, I've literally seen this through doing it myself. Building a business is one of the most difficult things you can do. So if you try to split your attention onto multiple things... Mm -hmm you'll never really be able to thrive fully in one of them. It's like, if you're trying to water 50 different plants, by the time you get to the 50th plant, that first plant is going to start dying. Mm. So you've got to kind of utilize your energy um, and focus. And focus, focus, like, focus you know, is mad important. Those economic principles of specialization, exactly. locking on one thing, exactly deliver, that. and yeah. that's it. Um, and then I've started to, through going on my own journey, I've started to kind of realise that becoming successful and whatnot, it's more of a an inner game as well. So people like to over-focus on the results and like what it is that they're doing to, let's say, make more money, etc. But what I've kind of found is that if you don't deal with things at the root, mm -hmm. then what you're doing, so the result or the outcome, is never really going to um, change permanently. Yeah. It's kind of like, let's say a tree, for example, that grows fruits. If the fruit is rotten, you can't really just pick the fruit and then try and yeah. fix the rotten fruit. You've got to deal with the... Um, what caused it to rot exactly, in the first place. Exactly that. And I think, yeah, it's, it's starting in the right place. So foundations in the yes. building. If your foundations aren't solid, doesn't matter how nice the bifold doors you put on the back. You know what I mean? You're going to get those structural issues off exactly the back end. That. So you have to start strong. Definitely. Talk about being strong and determined and, you know, having a lot of focus. I think it's sometimes very e easy, particularly as men sometimes, to let mm. ego take over. So, like, when you did have those instances, I've seen stuff where you've had people trying to have parties, where you've gone to places where, you know, people have had weapons and brought potentially knives yeah. to the property. Yeah. How have you managed to maintain that, look, I need to deal with this from a business perspective as opposed to, no, nah, they're disrespecting me and this is my pride and principle yeah, now. Yeah. 
I would just say just by looking at the bigger picture, mm-hmm. just by looking at the bigger picture and especially then because I had already started to become not like crazy prominent online, but my brand or whatever was kind of growing. I just thought, you know what, let me deal with this in a kind of like respectable or professional way mm-hmm. as, as opposed to just doing something stupid because that could have more damaging um, ramifications by like a split decision moment. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, just focusing on the bigger picture, I would say that's mm-hmm. what um, made me deal with it appropriately. That's good. I mean, social media, I think f- for a lot of people is a, a really good way to grow their businesses, mm-hmm. to create and build eyes on your brand so people get to know you and understand what you want. Um, Where have been some of the biggest wins for you from social media? Good question. Investors, Mm -hmm. big, big win. Um, Through building kind of like an engaged following, I feel like even if I wasn't doing property, I would still be calm and comfortable and I'd still have people checking in for what I'm doing because of the band, the brand rather that I've been building. What else would I say? Different types of opportunities as well. Mm-hmm. So um, people that wouldn't ordinarily reach out, reaching out and um, looking to collaborate on certain things. Yeah, I would just say opportunities, investors, mm-hmm. being able to kind of like boost my property business almost. I think a lot of people are quite shy to get started on social yeah, media. Yeah. They're scared to be themselves. You're yeah. very authentic. Have you had much negative comments along with of the good stuff? Yeah, that's always going to be there. Like if you if you put yourself out there, you've got to kind of just be prepared for it. It's just a byproduct of um, being out in the public eye. And I wouldn't recommend everyone like just be out there if you're not um, kind of ready for it because it's, it's, it's going to happen. So that's just something that you've got to kind of prepare yourself for and deal with as it comes. Yeah. But you found you definitely say more good than bad when it comes to social media space. Yeah, a million percent. A million percent, yeah. Nah, it's good. I re- like I said, I really like your content. For people who yeah. haven't, definitely make sure you check it out. Yeah, there's, some, there's some funny stuff, some interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah. He's got, he's got, he bought some of the team with him today. Yeah, man. You've got to big yeah. them up, man. Yeah, yeah. So he's helping guy, you he's, with the social he's media. He's actually the, um, the brains behind it. So okay. when I first bought my house, I basically called KD. I was like, you know what? I actually want to take property seriously. Mm-hmm. Then he just told me, all right, cool. Posts. Like the first ever post is crazy because I got like 10,000 followers off the back of it. He orchestrated it like, okay, post this, do it like this, caption this, da, 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 and then just went viral overnight. Then I kind of fell off when um, the longness happened with the first house, selling it, failed, um, fell through. And then I was just like, you know what, property is long. Then one of my other friends reached out and said, you know what, like you are actually doing well, just come back and, and continue to to make things happen. So then I spoke to KD again. I was like, cool, you know what, I'm ready to come back to social media. I'll put together a plan. This was literally in November. And then I've been working alongside him ever since just to continue to grow the brand and scale. No, that's great. And you've been doing really, really well with it. I, I really you. enjoy it. You're probably yeah. one of my favorite, favorite content people in the property yeah. space at the moment. Listen, I, I see myself as more than the property space, I'm yeah. being honest. Oh, yeah. Okay, so, oh, where yeah. do you see yourself? Let me, let me um, I just, that's that's kind of like, even in the bio, when when you ask me to, to type a bio, I, I just... By was... the way, if you want to get him on your pod, <laughs> don't ask him. He oh, gave me a dear. one-line bio that said... I'm documenting my journey. Yeah, well, that was his bio. Yeah. That's it still because um that's that's how I feel. Mm-hmm. I I just feel like I'm I'm someone just documenting my journey as I go along and I've experienced a lot of things and I'm just showing people some of the things that I've experienced. So with property, I don't want to put myself in the box of just our oh, property content mm-hmm. like hey guys, HMO conversion, this is what I'm doing. It's like it's it's boring. Mm-hmm. Because even most of the property content that I come across is just, it's just boring. Yeah. So I thought I don't want to be like that. And I want to be more than just property because I might move on to something else down the line. So why so looking box at myself personal into branding as opposed to exactly business branding? As opposed to just property. No, that's really good. I mean, I've really enjoyed talking to you. I hope you have all really enjoyed the episode. Where can people connect with you? How can they find you? Um, Instagram, RJ underscore hustle. TikTok, RJ underscore hustle. YouTube as well. I've started YouTube. Um, Going to be quite consistent with that. That's RJ hustle as well.
Okay. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you having you on. Yeah, you too, if you've liked this you. episode, make sure you like it. If you've got any questions for myself or Reese, then you can ask us in the comment section. If you haven't already, I don't know what you're doing, but make sure you subscribe and we'll be back next week with another episode.